<laughs> then we will start. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Bruno Pamola, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Polymers and Composites from the University of Minho in Portugal. During this next uh, roughly one hour, I'm going to wait a little bit that people can enter, and then I will continue my introduction. Okay. So during the next the next hour, I'm going to give you a on tools for code debugging and profiling inside OpenFOAM. And basically I will be showing you the tools I have acquired during my short journey within OpenFOAM. This presentation, the outline is the following. I'm going to start by giving, giving you an introduction to this course. Then we're going to have a little training on how to use GDB for debugging inside OpenFOAM. GDB does not have a graphical user interface. We're going to put one in with the use of VS Code. Okay. And then we're going to talk a little bit about memory profiling, the code profiling with the utility value. And if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask and interrupt, both for the online attendance, which I hope you are hearing me correct. Okay. So for this course, what are you going to need? <laughs> valid open form installation, GDB, which is going to be our program that we're going to use, VS Code, which hopefully I will convince you to use in exchange of Emacs, Vim, and uh, whatever text editor you're using currently, Valgrind should be used for memory profiling and code profiling, and the utility um, K-cache within for visualization of the output from Valgrind. Also, for this course, you should have a basic understanding of C++ and hopefully it will be done open from coding as well. Okay, so debugging is the process of finding interesting errors as well in the source code of any software. So basically, you have code in your open from utility or your application. To have some sort of error in the program is not working, you actually don't know what is wrong with your code, you'll have to it. Okay. Uh, debugging, or at least I've been now, so using it as a tool to understand how the code is structured and to learn a little bit more on programming, and hopefully, you can also use it for that. So within OpenFOAM, you have uh, a couple of probes for debugging. Most common, you have a sort of import statement where you want to print up, and you will edit your original code, put in some info statements, and check if the output is what you want. You have global debug switches which you can activate in your control bit if you put in the dictionary uh, debug switches, and then you go and see if the class which you want to debug has some hard code and debug the information. If you're lucky to have, if not, you will have to use the debug. Okay, and for my applications, I usually use GDB. You might have also other alternatives, but for this training, we'll be using GDB. So to use the debugger, you'll have to compile the code with the debug flag. Okay? And you have two ways to achieve this. Either you do a global compilation of OpenFOAM with the debug. This will make everything with the debug flag available to you. You'll be able to inspect everything in the source code. This will make your installation of open from three, four times bigger than the current size it is. So that's the price you have to pay. Also, you have to pay a substantial slowdown if you choose to, be, to go with this approach. It's very simple. You just go to the bash RC file, you edit the WM compile option instead of optimize, you change to the one. Compile the code again. But alternatively, you can use, yes. Uh, are you suggesting to No, 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 no. I'm telling you the possibilities for having debug flags inside OpenFOAM. Either you install everything with debug flag, or you're going to use the approach I'm telling you now, which is top level uh, setting for you to have debug flags in your application. And for you to have this. Yeah. Yeah, you compile everything with the debug flag. Is that uh, the thing with? Yeah. yeah, that is one option for you to have debug flags. I will wait five seconds for people to come inside the room. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. I'm sorry, the phone method. This one? And it didn't work out for me. If you have problems with installing after the training, then take a look at it. Okay? Because I usually have 
of um, optimized version for. I have already. I have optimized version for running the code and debug version, and I want to debug something. Okay. If you have problems with installing everything with full debug, we can take a look after the after the training. Okay. Now, second uh, approach, which is to include top level uh, debugging information to your people. You're going to have to edit your main folder, your options file, and you have to put a couple of flags for the input, which is minus, minus Z, ZDB3, minus zero, minus the full debug. So basically, you're going to go to your main folder, your options, you have whatever you have, and then you're going to include in the top a couple of flags. Okay. Clear? Yes. One compiles everything with debug flags, the other one will compile your top level utility with debug flags. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a training or uh, demonstration of using GDB with uh, Laplace and Phone, with a flange case, which is out of the box uh, utility or tutorial for multi Okay. Uh, Thank you for the notice. So after this training, I'm going to supply this folder and presentation to you. And you're going to have in here a myloplastion form case, which is myloplastion form with a couple of modified stuff. Okay. So first thing you have to do, go to your make folder. And I have this guy compiled, just a second. Perfect. Go to your make folder, go to the option. You can see this guy can pop out, include the, the flags I told you before. Okay, this part is simple enough. Okay, very well. Now we're going to compile the utility my Laplace and Foam, which is just Laplace and Foam with a little bit of extras for this training. And I'm going to move this guy to the corner. Okay, so for this training, I'm going to use Open Foam 2212. This is an out of the box installation. Okay. So if you do with simple phone, this guy will live under URS, live whatever you have for the path for the out of the box installation. Okay. So you can compile the utility. And you'll have to wait a little bit. Perfect. Now, we have the utility. We're going to launch the debugger. And for you to launch the debugger, you're going to type GDB followed by the name of your executable. In this case, it's my Laplacian. This will launch GDB for you. It will not run your case. So we're going to have GDB open, but nothing running. And now you have two options. If you know where you want to stop the code, you can define a breakpoint and use the run command. This will run your application in GDB. Okay. If you don't know, we can just type start. This will make a temporary breakpoint wherever it is at the first function, usually the main, and it will stop there and also run the code. So here it's going to tell us to place a temporary breakpoint somewhere on line 65, which will coincide uh, with the main functions. How do you see code in here? So hopefully you all can see, see the screen. Okay. You can use the list command. And list will list a couple of lines before and after where you want to start putting. Okay. And it will show you from 60 to uh, 1 before 70. Um, or you can specify the number of lines that you want. So you can do list print from 1 to 100. And it will activate pagination for you. And you can inspect the code. And if there is somewhere of interest you want to stop, you can stop in a current line. And we'll get into that in a second. If pagination is too much of a problem for you, you can set pagination off, run the previous command, and now you'll not have pagination anymore. Okay, this is just to see the code. In, uh, inside GDB, if you want to not clear the screen, but to put everything to the top, you press Control plus everything. Does not clean because if you scroll up, you'll see everything, but it will put everything to the top. This is not, however, the most interesting mode 
for presentation, you have something which is called the text user interface. And for you to access the text user interface, you'll have to do control plus X and control plus, sorry, not C, it's an X and control plus X. So you type control X, control A, and you'll pop into the text user interface. And here you can browse through your code with your mouse or with your arrow keys in this case, you can do left and right. But now you can no longer come to the previous comments because the arrows are used to browse through the code. Okay. So for you to do browse through your previous comments, you have control plus P for the previous comment. Okay. Control P. Control N for the next, if you are at the previous comment. And if you want to browse through the line, you have to do control B for backwards. Okay, So if you do control B, you're going backwards in the line. And if you want to go forward, it's control F. So now the only thing that sometimes might be in hand is for you to resize the size of the window. And for this, you have to request information on the window and what windows you have available. And this is maybe the info window comment. And it's going to tell you very well, you have the source window currently active, and now you can resize the, this window with a win, right? You pass the name of the window and the number of lines, not actually number one, they call it count, and you play with the size of this, uh, of this window, okay? So we're going to put it at 15, just because. Now, uh, we are stopped in here, and we're going to talk a little bit about execu uh, flow execution. We need to first tell the uh, GDB to stop somewhere. And this is made usually with a breakpoint. And for you to define a breakpoint, you have to type break or B for short, followed by the name of the file and the line where you want to stop, 12. OK? So for this case, we're going to stop, for instance, in line 67. And this guy is going to pop up a V and a plus C. So we have defined the breakpoint in line 67. If we want to make a breakpoint somewhere where you know a breakpoint can be made, if you go to the right.h, you know that here you're going to compute the gradient of temperature, and you can do like B for short rotation, right.h at line number six. Random line, okay? And you can put the breakpoint in another file. Okay, but now. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about management of your pointers because this is actually very useful. Uh, we have created now two breakpoints. We have not continued to the, any of the breakpoints, but uh, we have this defined. So how can you get information on what breakpoints are available to you? And what is the status of a current breakpoint? You can type in info break or big for short, and this is going to give you information on what breakpoints are active. Yes? You open it. Yeah, I have here something that, that says you're sharing your screen and it has a little red dot and it's, uh, and I guess it's sharing the screen. Well, I, I don't think you, you can. Let me see. Well, I'm seeing it in, in this computer, which is the computer from the organization. So. I have this guy here. So I entered the meeting. They gave me sharing permission. I'm sharing. Okay. So if on, if online is not seen, please say so. So what can you do with this sort of management to the breakpoints? You can disable them, delete them, or enable them. Uh, the comments are quite straightforward. You can just do disable followed by the name of the by the number of the breakpoint. For instance, disable breakpoint number two. And this guy is going to disable a breakpoint. This means the breakpoint will exist, but it will not stop when the code moves through that, that through that line. If you want to enable, you can enable breakpoint number two, and it will be enabled again. Or you can just delete them, like breakpoint number two and number three. And now you have no breakpoints. Okay, let's define them again. So line sixty-seven, which is good. And now let's speak a bit, a little bit about. Flow so execution. So in GDB, you will be able to do four commands to your code. You can continue 
the code until it hits the next breakpoint, execute the next line of code, step into a function, and finish the execution of the current function. Okay, so continue. It's going to be continue or C for short. So if you type in continue, you're going to break in line 67. Now we're going to do a breakpoint in line 71 in here. And if you do continue again, C for short, you're going to stop in your next breakpoint. And you can now do next or N for short, which is execute this next line of code. And this function is just printing I am function one, I am function two, nothing fancy about it. But you will see that the output in here is going to be scrambled a little bit. And this can happen very often. And for you to refresh the screen, you're going to type control plus L. Okay. Good. So now you can continue again in here. And now we're going to use the step command, which means step into a certain function, or S for sure. And now we have moved to a file called function one.c. And we are now in line six. And so you can do next. The output is scrambled because it printed something and refresh the screen. Type step again to get into this function. And now we are in function 2.c. And here we only have another function, which is called I am function 2. So the last command I am to speak of is the finish command. So finish. Finish means finish the current execution of the function. And the short notation is fin. OK, so you can use finish or fin. And this guy is going to finish the current execution. So now you have finished function two. You are at the end of function one. And you can step and you're back into the while loop. Now, I made this while loop an infinite loop on purpose just to show you the flow execution inside GDB. But there is also um, another thing which is very relevant in, in, uh, in GDB, which is very well. We are now again in function two.c. How did we come? this place because you can set up and i'm going to show you later special types of breakpoints where you can say please note uh break the execution of the code when a certain variable changes its value and you want to know how you get to where it changes value and you do this with the backtrace command i'm sorry uh, back uh, trace or vt for sure okay and this is going to print what gdb calls frames and the frame with the lowest number is where you currently are. And the frame with the highest uh, value is, or with increasing value is where you come from until you reach this point, okay? And you can navigate through the frames with the frame or F for short comment. And you can type in the number of the frame. For instance, you can do frame one and we're going to go to function one dot. And you can do frame two and you can go to the two where you come from originally. Very well. So we're going to go to frame zero again. We're going to execute a couple of lines here. And now, yes. Current frame. It executes the current frame and it leaves because that's the current function you are at. So in fact, if you, let's, let's do this again. So you are in function Y, right? If you type in fin, it's going to tell you, uh, run until I finished something in here. And you know that this from your stack frame is finishing the current execution of, of your function. So you pop out of the of the function you're currently at to its, uh, I guess, parent. Okay. Now, this is an infinite loop for to show this uh, flow execution control in uh, in GDB. And you can define or change variables inside the your code with GDB. You're going to use the set command followed by the name of your variable. What value do you want? Okay. So now if you pop or if you execute the next line of code, the while loop is not going to, to flag anymore and you're going to move on with the execution of the code. Okay. Now let's put a breakpoint somewhere in here. The rest is just standard my Laplacian phone. I just have a place here where I'm going to create a um, scalar field and a vector field to show you how to print quantities of interest in here. And then you have a for loop where you're going to populate a little bit of these values. We're going to populate the scalar field with the square of the temperature, and the vector is going to be um, iteration counter for a vector for a vector game. Okay, it's just going to be a vector with zero, 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 one, 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 two, 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 depending on the type of cycle you are in here. So we can define a breakpoint in line hand and continue the execution of the code. Yeah, I'm sorry. This has an issue because we are not in the a valid 
test cases within a top level code. So you can info B, delete everything because this is okay. Put a breakpoint again in line 100, ask it to run. This is in, in the infinite loop stuck. So it's printing everything. You can halt the execution with control C. You don't know where you are. You can do, in this case, it's better just to pop off of the um, text user interface. You can do backtrace. It's telling you, well, to reach here, you, you, you came from all of these functions. For this particular case, you're going to move to the top level frame, which is here. And you're going to set finish equals to zero again, go to frame zero again, continue. and we are where we are, or where we wanted to be in the beginning. Okay. Very well. Uh, we're going to go into the loop a couple of times to populate a little bit the uh, values. And that time should be okay. And if you know that you have a problem somewhere in a loop, this that I have just done is not really feasible. We're not going to continue, continue, continue until forever. Yeah. There are special types of breakpoints you can do, which are based on conditions. And these are called conditional breakpoints. And the syntax for conditional breakpoints works as follows. You type in break line where you want to break, or file top by line you want to break. For instance, line 104, you see. If, what's your condition? So i it's equal to 50. Okay, so we want the code to stop in cell 15. Which cell are we currently at? You can use the print command, or P for short, and this will print the value of a variable. For instance, cell i, number two. Okay. So we can type in, uh, let me just remove the previous breakpoint, otherwise it will continue with stop in here because we have defined it. this guy. So delete breakpoint number seven. Okay, look. and now you can type continue or C for short. And you have stopped somewhere. And hopefully, if I do print cell I, to be in cell 15, as you have requested. So instead of always being stepping and stepping, if you know you have a problem somewhere in specific, you can tell him halt execution if you find, if you match a certain condition. Okay? Now, on printing, because I told you that we are going to print a couple of values in here, you a lot of times want to know values of a certain field and you want to see what values do you do you have for the temperature for these quantities that we have just created. And the syntax for this is the following. If you are using scalar fields or volume scalar fields, um, you will do the reference name of your variable dot v at how many points you want to see. So 10, okay. this guy will print out the first 10 entries in here. Okay. Since we are in cell i, if I do print 17, you should start to see some zeros because it's not popular. So then we have initialized this guy to zero before. If you have a vector tensor quantity, the syntax changes a little bit. So now you can do test to be okay. You can do 17 again, just to show you that this is an iterator and everything is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, and so on. Okay, very well. Why is this particular syntax? You can just ask, please print my uh, test, which is my scalar variable in here, and it's going to print something like this. So you have to either come to this tutorial and check out to do it, or you have to try for yourself to see where the information on the field is stored. And the size of your field is stored in here, and the values are stored in the, the underscore variable. And that's why you are doing this in the memory address, you are the referencing the memory address to access the points at the special command inside GDB for how many points you want to see. Okay. Right. I told you also before that you have a special type of breakpoint which can break the execution of the of, of your solver when a value changes. And in here I purposely made something which is if cell is number 30, please change the value of cell 30 to 273. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, and we will, we will get into that in a second, but 
if you are impatient on that, you can use the what is command to check the type of a certain variable. So you should do a second. If you do what is, it's going to tell you, I am a volume scalar field. If you need more information on the object, in this case, I think it will give you all the class, not the actual object, but you can use the p-type command. And this guy will print a lot of information for you. So this is what is defined for a volume something field. A lot of information to give you in uh, in a single row. Now, let's go back. Yes. Yeah. Might be possible. I usually don't do that. I think, I don't know if you can do like um, uh, print t at uh, t test dot v at like um, 10 to 10 plus, no, this guy will not work. No, you don't have a way to put um, indexing in here. So if you do like 10 to 12, this guy will just print a couple of numbers in here. Yeah. So if it's possible, I don't know how. Usually I also don't do it. I will, I will show you at the end how to write this information to a file. And then you can check as many entries as you want. Okay. So uh, let's move on with a special type of breakpoint that will um, stop when something is changed on your command. So let me just check if I deleted the conditional breakpoint. No, we're going to delete it. Very well. Now. The, this type of breakpoint that will watch, that will stop when something is, is uh, changed, it's called a watch point. And the syntax for this is watch, and what do you want to watch? In this case, we're going to stop the code whenever cell 30 changes its value. Okay, so we're going to watch t, v underscore, whenever you have cell 30 changing its value. And if you go to info breakpoints again, this guy will appear and it will tell that you have a watch point. Now, this watch point will make your code and also the conditional breakpoint will make your code or your debugging experience slower. It has to check the condition whatever it in passes in order to break. But for this particular case, it's it's more than okay, and you can continue. And it will change, it will stop, not in the line where it changes the value, but afterwards. So if this line is not here, you will have possibly the breaking in possibly one of these two lines. Okay. And it's telling you very well, I changed my value from 291 point something to 273. This is Actually, quite useful feature. You can, or you might want to know when a certain flag flips from false to true or from true to false. You don't know where it is in the code. You put a watch point whenever it changes, it will halt the execution for you. Okay. Now, if you continue with this syntax that we have um, made so far, whenever you come to the bottom in here to the um, to assemble your your equation and then to solve, you should expect that value of cell thirty should change out, right? So if you continue. You don't have this line for here because you did the top level debugging information. You don't have debug information here. You don't know where you are. You have some information. You know that you are in phone, PCG, scalar salt. You don't know where in each line, but you know that it changed the value from 273 to 293. If you install this in the full debug version, you'll have information on this. Okay. Uh, very well. Let's. Um, let me check where I am currently. Let me go back to the top level frame. Let me put a breakpoint in line 126. Let me go back to where we were. Let me do a little bit of management on my breakpoints and delete the watch point. Not have this slow and continue until we get in here. So we have solved the system. We are now in feoptions.correct if this exists. Okay. Now, an important feature also in here is for us to use uh, functions and user defined variables. Okay. So we'll start with a function first, because I will show you later a function I have implemented to print the values of fields to a text file. And I will give this also to you. So for you to define a function, you have to define. You have to use the command define as numbers. And it's going to tell you very well, put whatever commands GDB allows, and you'll have to go online to check some useful commands in here. And finish with a keyword end, and this will be your function. Okay, so you can do, for instance, print argument zero plus argument, sorry, found argument number one, and end. So you have defined your function. Very well, let's use it. Add number one and two. 
and this guy is going to pop out something which is pound eight equals to three. Three is your re reply. Pound eight is the value history inside GDB. And you can use these values. Okay. You can, for instance, come back to this function again and do use whatever value was in the value history eight and add four. So this guy is seven. Okay. And you can also use your own variables. And these are known as convenience variables. These variables live only inside GDB. Okay. For instance, you can do a set my var equals to one. And if you want to print your variable, you can do print, sorry, my var. This guy is going to print one for you. So it's stored information. Another useful or very useful feature of GDB is for you to call functions inside the platform. Okay. For instance, you can do call from minimum value between one and two. Okay. And this can, you can call functions in here. And you can even set your own variables to a certain function. For instance, you can do uh, set gradients. It's going to be equals to form, find the volume calculus, gradient of the double temperature. And this guy computed the gradient for you. And if you want to see it, you are going to do print my graph. And you have this because this is a TMP object. So if you want to know what object it is, you do what is my graph. It's going to tell you it is a TMP object. And if you want to have access to this information, you need to give it what the pointer, the pointer information is. So you can do print my grad dot ptr underscore. And now you have information on this and you can use the syntax of before and chain everything in order to get information in this. I'm going to show you this in a second. So, yes? What do you mean by user function? Yeah, you can Okay, now uh, I have prepared in here, uh, in this case, a function called open form functions.gdb. The extension is not actually relevant. Okay. And this is just, uh, let me put some syntax. Why not? This, I have created a function with the define command in here. And this guy is just printing um, the internal field of a certain scalar or vector tensor quantity you want. And it has, you can put documentation inside this function. You have document name of your function and with an end and put a string inside. And it's telling you very well, if you only give me um, a volume field, I will just print everything for you to the screen. If you give me a volume field and another thing, I will save it to this other thing, okay? This is just using the same commands as we did before in here. Okay. The only thing different is, well, redirect everything to a certain file if you give me more than one argument. And afterwards, do a couple of shell commands to put the output. So instead of putting everything in line, put some spaces so that you can compare directly with the, with the, what comes out of open form. Okay. Let's see how to use this, um, this function. A second, I will clean this time here. Very well. Let's load stuff again. Let's go, yeah, we're already here. So for you to load your user-defined functions, you have to pass to GDB the minus X flag, followed by the file where you have your function. So funks.gdv, name of your executor. Okay, okay. Now start because this will, again, get stuck in the infinite loop. We know already how to go next. Define this variable to be zero. Next, and let's stop again in line 126 after you have solved linear system. Perfect. Okay. So now you might use something like this. So print field, or if you don't know what print field does, you can do print field, and it will print the text you have made before, which is helpful if you have a lot of functions and you don't remember what they do, uh, to use it. So print field. Temperature, okay. And this will print everything you have in your temperature, okay. 
or you can do print temperature and save it to a txt file. And this guy should put in here a .txt file with your input. Okay. Or you can do as we have done before with set my gradient equals to home. Let's call it calculus gradient of level of temperature. Very well. You know that this is a TMP. And we can do print field of my grad yard underscore. Hopefully the name is correct and save it to grad.txt. So now you should have another file in here with the values of internal field of your gradient. Okay. And if you let the solver continue, this guy will also compute the gradient and you can compare the results afterwards. Let's just delete all the breakpoints and let it finish. Sorry. Um, yeah. We delete everything. Yes, continue until you finish. So exit, exit normally. Good. This has finished. So now we should have in here a time step with temperature, gradients, and you can very easily compare the, the results if you are in doubt. So you can do like meld, e.txt, your time point. By the way, meld is just a, a utility that you can install to compare to compare and text files. Temperature. So what are we missing from standard output? Boundary conditions and the header of open form. The All of the rest should be the same, right? So you'll have difference in the beginning because you have no header and you should have difference in the bottom, because you have no boundary conditions. This just prints the, the internal field. If you want to extend this function, feel free. Okay. And it's just for the sake of completeness, if you want to compare the gradient also. It's basically just the, the, the same thing. You have a header on one side, don't have on the other, and here you have boundary conditions, and in the other you don't have boundary conditions. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. The utility to write. Yeah. This currently the debugging section is only on serial. Programming. If you are interested, and if a lot of people are interested, next next um, workshop I will prepare one for debugging in parallel. Okay, and you, it, we can also use GDB for it, and I can adapt this function that will do uh, stuff for parallel um, for parallel execution. Currently, this one is only for serial week. Okay, no the mail is just to compare files. Sudo apt get. <laughs> if you want it for, if you want it for Windows, you can also have it in um, as an executable. And this is just to give me file A, file B, and compare what is the difference between file A and file B. If that has nothing fancy to it. Um, okay. So now let's talk a little bit about putting this stuff with a user int, a graphical user interface, because majority of the times. People get a little bit adverse to only have terminal, 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 and you can use VS Code for this because VS Code will actually run GDB on the background. However, VS Code might not allow you to have out of the box the whole functionality of GDB. Okay. So only to my knowledge recently, they allow you to put a data breakpoint, which is the watch point in, uh, in GDB. Okay. For that, we were not allowed to use it from here. So very well. What do you need to run this inside the, inside VS Code? I have prepared in here. These are just a list of commands that I have shown you. This is the the user defined uh, function to print the fields, and hopefully you can see the screen. This is just a um, launch.json file, which you can include in a hidden folder for VS Code, which is called dot VS Code. And here you can put your launch.json. And to make things short, you will take this file, change whatever your program name is and whatever, wherever it lives. Where do you want to execute your, um, or what is the case where you want to run your solver? And if you have um, 
a file with custom functions for the uh, for GDB. If you don't have anything, just clear this. Okay. Next. So is that a question? No. Sorry. Now, uh, what is the yes? You put the um, you put this file where you open GDB. Oh, sorry, where you open VS Code, not GDB. If your test case lives somewhere else, just adapt the path to where your code is. Currently, I'm saying, yeah, come to the working space folder and it's slash uh, flange. If this lives somewhere else, just somewhere else. Um, okay. So what is the advantage that I find in using uh, VS Code? Basically, you can use this. This is a, this is a, you can come here, put in here the source code of OpenFOAM, and you can browse a little bit through the, through the source code. So, let me see if, if it will behave well today, because yesterday it was giving me some problems with detecting the, the utilities, but you can, for instance, the right, you can pop inside the file, and you can try to look for the, um, you can try to look for references in the source, and it will navigate through, through the source code, which is helpful. Now, debugging in here, very simple because this will be running GDB on the background and we have seen how to run GDB. So the only difference here is breakpoint is made like this. Narrow, another breakpoint is made like this. You want to run the code, just press play. Now, okay, this guy should be stuck in the infinite loop. Let's change it again. This will actually be helpful because all of your variables are going to live in something called uh, locals in here or at least in here okay. and you can instead of using the set command you can just edit directly the name of a variable okay and we have to break one somewhere yeah let's play now in terms of organization it's a little bit different different but if you are used to gdb this is different so your backtrace is your call stack so if you want to come inside a function, this will start to increase to, to where you are. Probably this, this function is not a, a good example for this, but OK. So this is increasing. You're going into layers of where your function is going. And we put this guy here. Okay. Conditional breakpoints, you can type here and do edit breakpoint and put an expression in here, which is what we have seen before. But if you are used to working with GDB, you can come to the debug console and it's going to tell you. Yeah, you can use GDB commands by using the minus exec followed by the command. So for instance, if you want to use our um, the function that was made before, you can do, for instance, exec help in field. And this guy will execute the function for you. This is not available to you inside the, the interface of or the graphical user interface of um, of uh, VS Code. Now, apparently, this has finished loading the source code in here. So now, if I want, for instance, to know what a scalar field is, I should be able to browse through where these files are defined in here. So I can open this guy up, and it should load a little bit more. But you should be able to check the definitions of where stuff are, and you can browse through the code. Let me see if it if it is able to do it, and that will finish the segment on using VS Code, which is taking GDB, just putting a graphical user interface if you're interested in it, and you can also use it as a terminal for, for coding, and usually this is my default go-to tool for coding in OpenFOAM. Okay, we're going to ignore it. It's searching, it can hear this, so it should be able to work to other stuff. Okay, next. Bugs usually come in various forms. One of them is for us to have um, memory-related bugs. And a very good utility to detect memory-related bugs is Valkyrie. OK? So we're going to use the, uh, this, this, just a second, this one is important. This way, it will not get stuck inside an infinite loop. OK. We're going to create here, I'm going to show you a couple of defects and show you how Valgrind, uh, Valgrind works in order to detect these defects. We have here 
um, scalar field which is going to allocate to the heap. We're going to print the information of this scalar field, but we're not going to detect the leak, the pointer. So we're going to, in fact, have a memory leak in the code. And compile this. And hopefully, is the terminal uh, legible or should I increase the font size? Better? Same thing. Okay. No, better. So we can go to the flange tutorial where we work. You can type my Laplace and phone. Everything works perfect, but you know that you have a memory leak in the, in the code. Okay. So you can do this usually. I never remember the, the flags I use, but you call Valgrind. The default tool is going to be memcheck, and memcheck is the memory uh, memory debugging tool that lives inside the toolbox, which is Valgrind. And it's not mandatory for you to have the full debug information, but you have to have debug information for it to know where it is getting bubbled. And I just pass in the flags, uh, check for leaks, check every kind of leak, and track origins if I have un uninitialized variables, put everything inside the log called mem, uh, mem check of the XT, and then I just change the name of my soul. You have a little definition in here, which is from these two sources in the bottom. So you can just come here, copy and paste, put in your solver or your utility. Running, running programs inside algorithm will make your program very, very slow or the execution very, very slow. So just have a representative case and do not put here meshes that are very big because this will run very, very slowly. Um, okay. And can come here into flange and now we should have a mem check report. Now, when you have, and we will see this later, when you have uninitialized value, this will be a very, very big report. For memory leak, this is more or less straightforward. To make things easy, you can start from the bottom, which is very well. What what are my problems? And it's going to tell you have definitely lost something, and you can indirectly have lost something. Where is this something located? Very well. This something is located in um, in line 135, which should be where we have allocated this memory. And he sees during the execution of the program that we have not released this pointer for this memory that was allocated. So. It's telling you that somewhere in here, you're going to have problems. Solutions to this, easy fix. You can just delete, you can just delete this, compile the solver again. Give more of a couple of words that are unwanted. Call Valgrind again. This guy out. Perfect. And now this guy should again from the bottom. Everything was free. Do you have anything else to worry about? It's going to do everything was is okay. And usually you want to see something like this when you use this. Or single core. If you use this for parallel processing, you'll have something Valgrind will detect as efforts from the um, from the MPI library. I don't know how to tell you to fix it, but if you use it in single core, at least you know that in single core you don't have problems. So um, for memory for parallel, if you want next year, I can prepare something on debugging in, in debugging and profiling in uh, in parallel. Kira. That's a good question. I actually don't know if the problem comes from actually bargaining the, um, having problems with MPI. And this is MPI and detects like false positives of stuff that can happen. And you might have to write something which Valgrind uses, which are suppressed files, which says, well, this guy is a false positive. If you see it, ignore it. And at the end, you filter out everything and get only your efforts, but this needs a little bit of investigation, at least on my side, in order to give you a complete answer to where it, where it comes from. Could be. Okay, let's continue with, uh, the uninitialized, um, with the uninitialized section. Okay, so here, what do we have? You have a scalar quantity which is being created, not initialized, and then you say, print my value, 
and you have an if statement if something happens, activate the switch. Because you did not uh, supply an initial value to the scalar quantity, what's going to happen in here? Well, it depends on what you get in here that the compiler is making it, right? So if you come back, well, again, so you might, or depending on which language you come from, you might say, well, this will initialize to zero by default. Uh, OpenFOAM is going to give you a warning when you compile, saying that you have something uninitialized. We're going to ignore that for the time being. If you run the code, it's going to tell you, well, my value is something very, very, very small, but I am higher than one. This is not the behavior you want. Okay, the compiler is going is giving you an, uh, a warning, but this sort of stuff can happen. So, branch, uh, and we're going to run Valgrind again, and this the output of this one is going to be very, it's going to be bigger than it should, but um, if you are aware of this sort of situation, it should be more or less uh, easy to fix. Very well. And uh, yeah. so this guy gets very, very big. This uh, bigger than it should, in my opinion, but okay. So for this sort of cases, we're going to see that in main, you have a problem and you have a problem in the outstream because either it is a conditional jump or an uninitialized value. You have to go to the code and check. In this case, we're going to come here. Yeah, this is an uninitialized value. How to solve this? Just initialize your variable. This is also an, uh, an easy fix. Okay. Let's move on to segmentation faults. And segmentation faults just means you're messing with memory you shouldn't. Okay, and you can have like a simple case in here, or I have placed a couple of examples so that you can you can you can try them out if you want. Uh, yeah, this is okay. So what are we doing here? We're creating an array of four labels. We are initializing it to four, three, two, one. Nothing fancy. You're going to print the first element in the array, and then you're moving or you're changing the memory location of the fifth element in the array. This does not exist. You're messing with memory. You should. And you are assigning a value here to something that is going to, to be out of bounds or should be out of bounds. Okay. And this sort of error is not that incredible to see, depending on, on how on how you code stuff. So you can compile this very well, you can go to flange. Are we expecting um, a segmentation fault in here? Depends on where you are accessing the array and deciding. So if you run the code, this will run fine. But you are changing memory, but you shouldn't have access to it. You created an array of four and you're moving the fifth element. It's somewhere in memory. Okay, so you've made something weird. Um, and you can just pass Valorant through it. And it will tell you that you have no memory leaks because you have deleted the pointer, but you are changing something you shouldn't. This guy is going to tell you very well, you have no leaks, but if you scroll up, it's going to tell you, you are you want to write somewhere that is invalid. It's going to tell you somewhere in line 160, you are doing, so, or sorry, in this case, line 162, to be more precise. Yeah, here. Okay. Very well, you have a couple of more examples in here, but due to the sake of time, I'm going to show you the profiling utility inside Validate. Okay. Let me just, um, take everything in here out and let me comment this guy out also and let me comment this guy out so now you have laplace info this is the modifications i've made to the code here and here so, Valgram is a tool of tools, so, uh, and you have several tools that are allocated to different tasks. We have seen MemCheck, which is a default utility that does memory uh, debugging. You have also a profiler, okay? Now, to use the profiler, they just recommend that you have the minus G variable and that you leave optimization on. 
Okay, so we're going to compile the code just with the minus g variable. Okay, lines. very well. And how do you call it? We're going to type algorand minus minus tool, which is specify which tool you want. And this tool is called algorand. And followed by the name of your solver. Let me see. I tend to also copy the, the, the things in here. Put this guy and paste it here. I do not want to simulate cache for this example and in my Laplace and so okay. This guy is going to run uh, your code inside of Algren. Because of the minus G flag, it is able to instrument your code and it's going to create a profile of the um, of your code. The output is called calgren.out followed by the PID number you're currently executing the code in. Okay. Now, some things to take, make clear before we go into this discussion. This is a very good utility to profile. I'm not able to judge currently if this is the best for parallel or if it should be better to monitor the time. This is a utility that you, you have others inside OpenFOAM. You can, in fact, compile OpenFOAM in profiling mode, which just activates a minus PG flag, which you can use in, um, in uh, GNU Profiler. For instance, okay. So usually this one is uh, regarding as a good utility for profiling. It does not measure time of execution. It measures the number of instructions that are being made. An instruction can understood it as assembly instructions that your code is doing for something. Okay. Now you can analyze the results in two ways. One is to call. Um, call Right, annotate, followed by the name of your output file from Valgrade. Okay, but because this is open form and you have several functions, the output is going to be big. A prettier way to check the results is for you to, to use the utility a cache green, which was in the which I told you in the beginning, and this is quite straightforward. Uh, you just call the utility followed by your output from Valgrade. Very good. This is going to give you a graphical user interface that looks something like this. And now you will need to analyze a little bit the results. Okay. I'm using this inside WSL. So we have some cost of running this inside WSL. You can start to look from main below. Okay. And Val is going to have two types of costs. It has um, inclusive costs, which is what is the cost of my function plus everything I am executing inside the function. So if we can understand this as um, if I execute main, main should have like 100% because everything is running inside main. Okay. And you have also something which is called in here itself, which inside the lingo of algorithm is called an exclusive cost, which is what is the actual price of my function. Okay. And uh, if you filter this with self, you can check which are the functions that you are paying more inside the code. I do not want to analyze this. I'm just giving you the tools for profiling. Okay. Called is the number of times a certain function is called. So you can, for instance, solve, which we have solved once. You can come here and check uh, that it has been called once because this is what, what we actually did. And the number of instructions that it did to fulfill this function. Location is where your function is located, and function is the name of your, your function. In this corner, you have types. Types are the quantities you have monitored. If you monitor like cache misses and cache related information, it will pop everything in here. You can, you can filter your results through, through, through this box. Colors are uh, how many times this function has been called. All colors are, are a hierarchy of what are the parents or which functions are parents, grandparents, and so on of this function. Okay, so this function, the distance one is what? Direct. 
caller. Two means the parent of this function. So which function called this one? Three is the grandparent and so on and so on until you reach ideally main because I'm using the OSL that has a lot of stuff going on behind. Kali map. I actually will never use this guy. And source code, if you have everything in uh, with debug flex, you might have your source code appearing in here showing which lines is being executed and, or which lines it's where the source code is related to this okay. So This is it for the for this training. And if you have questions, please do let me know. Yes. Monitoring blocks of code. Are you to... Yes. Yeah, you, you have to, to put into use instead of compiling everything in debug mode, you can compile it with the minus PG flag, which is the flag you have for profiling. And how to actually by that time guessing you have to use GNU profiling because those are exactly the flags you use for GNU profiling and you just run the function to measure the time execution of the functions. Now this will be a statistical approach. You'll have to execute functions a couple of times, average them out and have the time average for execution. You do a same to the code, you run the same thing, got better, perfect. Got worse. If the statistics is good enough, then it's okay. This guy is measuring the number of instructions it's running inside of our if you go online, they will tell you that this guy is a little bit better than uh, than the GNU profiler. Because I've never used GNU profiler, only one. So, yes. I can use it with an utility called the TMPI, which is going to launch multiple windows for you, uh, attach a GDB process to each one of them, and you can... Oh, this, is, this is the one, yeah. This, this is the next one. Sorry? Yes. Sorry. Uh, let me put it in presentation, but see if it's better. Is it better? I usually use this utility. I was initially planning on giving part of profiling in here, but constraints is not allowed to put everything in a single talk. So uh, usually I use this uh, utility. This is going to launch multiple windows for you. It will attach the GDP to each one, and you can go window to window and do debugging in parallel. Yeah, you know, for your computer. HPC, I think you'll have to have something different. This is for your, uh, for your machine, OK? Any more questions? Yes. I've never used uh, HPC toolkit for profile. They just print the, um, the internal value of a field. Yeah, they are in the presentation. It's not a problem. They are in the, I. Let's keep this portion in here because I was showing you the, the code, right? So, <laughs> uh, but I will give you the presentation and the test case, test case, the, the code in here, and you can use the, the utility at will. It's not the problem. This is just printing stuff. It's just a command to print something, but the something it's printing, instead of printing portions of the array, it's printing the whole thing. You have access to the size of the array, so print everything. Afterwards, you just need to know, yeah, how do I put something inside a file? They have something which is redirect to something. And you'll just redirect the output. And then what you are doing in the bottom is, well, the output is not how I want it to look. Just a little bit of manipulation and put it in an open form-ish like format. That's basically it. So this is no problem at all. More questions? Yes. 12, slide 12. Yes. Well, I'm going to start this. Um, that one is not using this. You can use VS Code also for parallel debugging. It is a little bit more cumbersome because I don't know how to automatically attach the GDB to the processes. Usually, if you find documentation in open form, they will give you something like you make an infinite loop, you run this in parallel, processor will get stuck in the infinite loop. 
you attach one process, you attach two processes, three processes, as many processes as you want. Go to the loop, break it, and then window by window in here. So now I will have five GDB, five VS Code's window open, and this is too cumbersome. I just use the other utility, which will use teammates and um, to put different, uh, let's call it tiles in the screen. And up to four, it's very feasible. If you have uh, this monitor and to be working for the in for for Windows, so it will also synchronize your keyboard. So when you type a command in one, it will type the command in the others, and you can step in all of them, step or next in all of them, or you break this synchronization and you move to another window, do whatever you want to do there, synchronize back again, and move forward. Other question? No, then. This is my talk, just a final notice. We are going to, or a final notice for those of you who are close to Portugal and Spain. We are organizing the FOMI Viria this year, this year in Guimarães. And if you are close by to Portugal or close by to Guimarães, please feel free to attend this conference. Conference, it's a meeting of Iberian users of OpenPop. So thank you all for being here.